When I was a bit younger, I spent a week listening to virtually nothing but an extended mix of hopes and dreams and save the world on repeat for hours on end. I was on a family road trip, the only one I've ever been on, and my family and I were riding around in a camping van we'd rented to explore colleges around the lower half of my home state. Most of that time was spent driving, and I remember staring out the window while listening to hopes and dreams, reading fantasy books while listening to hopes and dreams, and falling asleep while listening to hopes and dreams. I was just beginning my college application process at the time, and the prospect of entering a new chapter in my pre-adult life terrified me. In spite of this, or more realistically because of it, I could think about nothing that week but Undertale. Undertale had a profound impact on me. I was a bit of a lonely teen, though I didn't really recognize my feelings at the time as being driven by loneliness. It seems almost silly now, but Undertale's straightforward themes of friendship, empathic courage, and determination really resonated with me then and, to some extent, still influence my thought processes today. Its characters and world became so familiar in my mind that they felt safe to return to in moments of doubt and insecurity. Listening to hopes and dreams, as corny as it is to say, gave me hope that I could greet the new world I was headed into with the same sort of curiosity and determination that I greeted the ruins with, and reminded me that moving forward, however scary it might be, doesn't have to mean leaving the things you cherish behind. <clears throat> in the years since, I've often asked myself how a game I spent no more than 10 hours with left such a dramatic impression on me. What is it that makes Undertale's universe and characters feel not only memorable, but intimately familiar? Writing plays a big part in this, I'm sure, but I think it's significant how my mind always returns to the game's soundtrack. The Undertale OST not only managed to capture my experience with the game, but define it. I think most who've played Undertale remember the soundtrack's peculiar charm, and even those who haven't remember the absurd popularity of Megalovania. It's easy to acknowledge how catchy the songs in the game are, but the memorability of different melodies and character themes doesn't, on its own, explain the massive appeal of the soundtrack. It doesn't explain why I have such an emotional connection to the game, why its titular theme will make me cry no matter when or how many times I listen to it, or why I get the feeling of being transported to another world even now, years later, when Snowden Town comes up on Shuffle on Spotify. I've played a lot of games I absolutely love that also have stunning soundtracks. Celeste, God of War, Fury, to name a few. The OSTs for all these games are brilliant in their own ways, but none of them have quite the same effect on me. There is one game, though, whose soundtrack does. Outer Wilds. I played Outer Wilds over the summer, and I don't think I'll ever play anything like it again. It's genuinely difficult to explain why to someone who hasn't played the game. Part of it has to do with the unparalleled sense of agency and discovery, and I don't think any game could end up being my favorite without the kind of truly wonderful writing that makes exploring Outer Wilds' alien ruins both exciting and endearing. The soundtrack, however, was without a doubt one of the most crucial elements of my experience. It helped craft a narrative in a way that the writing alone didn't, which is, I think, what sets both Outer Wilds and Undertale's OSTs apart their ability to tell a story. I found the shared quality puzzling at first. These are, after all, very different games with unique approaches to game design and scoring, and with such extreme differences, it can be hard to see how the two soundtracks might be comparable. If you've played Outer Wilds, you know the game isn't linear. In fact, it's one of the most non-linear games I've ever played. The only quote-unquote linear section of the game comes at the beginning, when you're required to find your ship's launch codes before you can roam the solar system. If you want to fly the ship, you'll have to head to the observatory and, on the way, probably encounter a few tutorial-like activities that'll prepare you for space travel. Once you get to the top of the village and activate the Nomai statue within the observatory, all limits to exploration are off, and, even more critically, there's nothing telling you how to go about it. No quest markers, no quests, only your curiosity and a few helpful clues from your friends to guide you. You might decide to explore your home planet first, making the mistake, like I did, of jumping into one of the geysers in the village without a spacesuit and getting blasted to Kingdom Fuck. You might check out the Adel Rock and find Lonely Esker spying on the townspeople from his campsite, or venture through the cloud layer of Giant's Deep only to stumble into a twister. Or you might see what happens when you fly into the sun. There are narratives to discover and take part in, but it's almost entirely up to the player how and when they want to engage with them. Outer Wilds' story is just as much about the player's unique series of accidents, discoveries, and moments of silent observation as it is the bits of lore you find hidden in ancient alien scrawlings. It is just as much the many simultaneous, clockwork-like events occurring in sequence over and over in the game's universe as it is any single string of experiences. Undertale, on the other hand, is a much more linear journey, and much of the game's soundtrack benefits from this linearity. One of the ways it does so is through leitmotifs. I know, I know, but let me finish. Many great videos and essays have already been made about the leitmotifs Toby Fox uses throughout Undertale's soundtrack. I'd recommend checking out How the Song Undertale Hits Home by GameScore Fanfare for an excellent analysis on one of my favorite songs from the game. As Jason Yu writes in his essay, An Examination of Leitmotifs and Their Use to Shape Narrative in Undertale, to quote Wikipedia, A leitmotif is a short, constantly recurring musical phrase associated with a particular person, place, or idea. 
Perhaps the best example of this in popular culture is in Star Wars. When the Imperial March plays, you know Darth Vader is going to show up. The Imperial March is a leitmotif that is associated with the character of Darth Vader. Undertale is full of leitmotifs that fit all three definition types. There are leitmotifs that refer to certain characters, certain areas of the game, and larger ideas and themes that run through the game as a whole. Spoiler warning from here on out. The first and probably most obvious example at use sites is the main theme, which is used to evoke a sense of home and safety and serve as checkpoints for the player at critical points in the game. He points out how the game establishes this as the main theme through a mix of subtle and more noticeable repetition. If you paid any attention to the music when you first booted up the game, you may have realized that the song that's playing now on the menu screen is a simpler, more upbeat version of the song which plays during the intro. The melody line in both songs is what will become a recognizable pattern that plays throughout Undertale, and because we've encountered it twice as we first enter the game, it signals itself as the game's theme. This theme begins to feel safe for us, both because it plays almost exclusively in safe areas, like Toro's home and the hotel near the end of the game, and because it reminds us of our earliest moment of safety, the intro sequence. You writes how, as soon as we start the game, the Undertale theme is now a familiar tune in a world of potentially new and different and scary possibilities. As a result, when you hear the main theme again, all of the ideas and emotions associated with that theme are brought back and repurposed in the new context. I'd like us to keep this thought in mind for later. A less obvious example of the leitmotif, and one of my favorites, is the overworld ostinato. You can hear it here in Ruins, where it's first introduced. You can also hear it here in another medium, from the Hato Hotland area and in Core from Core. An ostinato is a repeating musical phrase, and overworld is commonly used to refer to an area within a video game that interconnects all its levels or locations. You names this phrase the overworld ostinato because of how it appears in all four areas of the game. Unlike a theme, a term which refers to more attention-grabbing patterns in a piece of music, an ostinato, as we're referring to it at least, differentiates itself as a common background element that plays continuously throughout a song and creates a sense of cohesion between songs without itself becoming the focus of each piece. Think of it like the crust on a pizza. You might order a handful of different pizzas with different toppings and sauces, white, vegetarian, Hawaiian, plain cheese, and even some with different types of crust, like thin crust, deep dish, or garlic crusted. Despite their differences, you would recognize all of them as pizzas, and yes, Hawaiian is real pizza. In the case of the overworld ostinato, you might not consciously recognize each song it appears in as an overworld song, but the running similarities between each piece subconsciously register with players to help them feel like they're in an expansive, connected world. For the listener, it gives structure in a sense that you're really listening to one large work of music rather than small, disparate pieces. Let's put a pin in this idea, too. There are many other examples we could look at, but the point is this. These motifs help connect songs thematically, and the reshaping and sometimes combination of themes throughout the game enhances the feeling of narrative progress. As you move further through the game, new pieces of music making use of familiar motifs remind you of characters and locations you've encountered previously. Certain motifs persist throughout the world, tying different story arcs, locations, and characters together. This doesn't just make the world feel more interconnected, it adds meaning to your encounters. If we take leitmotifs as a secret ingredient that makes Undertale's soundtrack so uniquely effective, the question for me becomes, how does Outer Wilds achieve the same thing? Or more specifically, how does Outer Wilds create a similar feeling of cohesiveness and narrative progress without this tool? As I mentioned earlier, one of the big reasons leitmotifs function so well in Undertale is due to the game's linearity. There's a distinct progression to Toby Fox's music, one that only works, or at least works best, when each song is arranged in a particular sequence. Asriel's theme wouldn't have the same impact without previous run-ins with Toriel, Asgore, and Flowey, in which we hear each character's theme and slowly understand the connections between them. In this way, linearity allows for a kind of control that very much defines our relationship to the game's soundtrack and its relationship to the story. It seems obvious, then, that composing music for a non-linear game comes with a different set of challenges than those Toby Fox faced in writing for Undertale. But I think part of the answer to how Andrew Prallo addresses these challenges lies in the two quotes we highlighted earlier. First, let's identify the two main qualities we're looking for. One, interconnectivity, or the extent to which the soundtrack makes the game's universe feel more connected, and two, evolving context. How the soundtrack adds depth to the game's story by reshaping our perspective. We can see Outer Wilds achieving both of these things in the first few songs of the game through the use of instruments and textures. 
Like Undertale, Outer Wilds opens with a version of the game's main theme played here. The next song you hear as you start the game, Timber Hearth, named after the planet you wake up on, makes similar use of the banjo and guitar. Through these songs, the banjo is immediately associated with the idea of beginnings, with home, calm, and safety. To me, this second song sounds like waking up knowing that dawn is just around the corner with the feeling that, for the next 22 minutes, anything is possible. You're soon guided towards the observatory where you hear this song. The museum continues to use the banjo that you hear in the menu theme in Timber Hearth, but in a very different way. Reverb drenched, disembodied banjo plucks set to atmospheric pads give the impression of space and set a reverential tone that fits with the building's meager yet proud display of Outer Wilds Ventures history. The spacey texture of the song also hints at your own upcoming interstellar adventures, and by reusing the game's main theme, the museum creates a further association between that theme and the idea of space and exploration. In this, there's a combination of new ideas, space and the unknown, with already established ones, home and safety. The new mood of the piece recontextualizes a familiar tune, as the main theme can now be heard somewhat paradoxically as both safe and adventurous. The repeated use of specific instruments with variations on the textures applied to them allows these pieces to add layers of depth to one another. In just these first three songs, we've seen how textures can create distinct moods. We've also seen how certain instruments or sounds can come to characterize or be associated with certain places. The banjo, for example, becomes recognizable as the sound of timber heart. Different instruments can also be associated with different people. One of my favorite things about Outer Wilds are the other Hearthian explorers scattered across the solar system that you bump into throughout your travels. Their campsites serve as places of respite, where players can top off on fuel and oxygen, catch up on useful information about the universe, or simply relax and toast marshmallows for a few minutes before the sun explodes. Each of Timber Hearth's explorers carries their own instrument, courtesy of Nice. Gabro plays the flute, Feldspar the harmonica, Chert drums, and Rebeck the banjo. All characters play parts in the same song, the main theme, which you can easily discover if you manage to line two or more of them up at the same time with your signal scope, an ingenious gameplay tool that allows you to search for and listen to sounds coming from different parts of the solar system. With each explorer on a different planet, these instruments can be instrumental in beckoning new players toward unexplored locations, such as the Tower of Quantum Knowledge in Brittle Hollow, which you can find by following Rebeck's signal beneath the planet's crust. Later, they can also serve as reminders of distant friends when you've lost your place in the universe. Riley Hopkins of Uppercut summarizes this feeling nicely. They were playing in time with each other even though they were planets apart. Music was literally connecting them, making sure they knew that they were never alone, they were never forgotten by their friends, and they were all still a team. Eventually, these instruments become mnemonic devices, sounds that help you remember who and what is to be found on each planet in the memories you made there. Feldspar's harmonica might cast you back to your first run-in with an anglerfish, while Rebecca's banjo might conjure up the feeling of falling into a black hole. I think it's clear through all of this that the feelings you build up around these sounds don't arrive all at once. A relationship to them develops as you play, with different pieces of music taking on new meaning as you accumulate new experiences. This is demonstrated even more so through the game's Nomai compositions than through its Harthian ones. As you explore the ruins of the Nomai, a now extinct alien civilization, you'll hear a number of pieces lending specific landmarks and locations and atmosphere very different from the ones suggested by the songs we just heard. The Nomai themselves almost never appear in the game, but the repetition of Nomai sounds and motifs helps create the impression of a distinct culture. As the main theme in Travelers' instruments breathe life and character into the solar system, Nomai songs humanize, or people-eyes, the Nomai. There's something very distinct in their music that makes it feel like their music, music they made, not just generic mystery music. Because of this, I felt just as, if not more, connected to the Nomai as I did to my Harthian friends despite their absence. These songs might at first come across as haunting, exciting, or mysterious. Something I've heard time and again from those who played the game, however, is how these feelings are apt to change. One of the reasons for this is how the game uses its lore to recontextualize its soundtrack. By lore, I mean stories about things that have already happened in the game's universe, as opposed to stories that play out during the player's journey. As I explained earlier, Asgore and Toriel's themes in Undertale, for example, gain meaning as you learn about the two characters' past relationship. Their themes might even start to sound different to you, as your newfound knowledge allows you to recognize the motifs residing in them, making the individual components of each song more distinct and giving you a greater appreciation for how they fit into the composition as a whole. I'd like to compare this to my experience with one of the most often heard songs in Outer Wilds, the Nomai. I 
Again, spoilers here on out. There's a lot going on in this song. The muted piano and delayed music box or harpsichord-like plugs stand out the most, their rhythm and timbre reminiscent of something antique and slightly broken. These are accompanied by deep, dangerous bass notes followed by off-putting reverse tones. The texture behind all this is vast and almost guttural, at times becoming the focus of the piece and bringing forth a voice of its own. Is this the sound of a secret being uncovered, I wondered? Is it the kind of music this ancient civilization would have made, distorted by the degrading effects of time? Often it felt like hearing a ghost, or like I was picking up on something incomplete and indecipherable, yet still recognizable. Much of the game's lore validated aspects of this initial impression. A lot of the Nomai's technology, I realized, is still utilized extensively by the Harthians, from the gravity crystal tech that keeps you oriented upright inside your ship, to the warp technology that calls your drone, allowing an echo of the Nomai to live on in this new civilization. The more I got to know the Nomai, though, the more this song began to represent something different. It eventually took on a melancholy and intimate character. In an interview with Only Single Player, which I've linked below, Andrew Prello says that Alex and I are really going for a feeling of nostalgia and familiarity. As the player kind of discovers that you're stuck in a time loop, you start to realize what the music is wistfully sad. Why there's this emotive lilt to the music throughout the game. This was definitely true for me. Step by step, I learned about the Nomai's fascination with the eye of the universe. About how they had crash landed and become stranded in the solar system, cut off from their home and, to a large extent, their culture. I learned about the dark age they experienced and about their subsequent scientific renaissance, where they constructed the intricate web of time travel, deep space probing, and exploding stars powering this whole adventure, all of it serving an overarching and multi-generational goal to locate the eye. Time and again, this search proved futile, and I think some of the disappointment of the Nomai's failure is heard in this song. Like the empty ruins you explore, the song is also a constant and increasingly painful reminder of the Nomai's absence. It is hopeful in a way, though, as it shows us that their story didn't end with the crash. It didn't end with their separation, either, in the continual presence of the Nomai, the song that is, across different locations, representing different Nomai populations and moments in history, serves as a retrospective symbol of their solidarity. Even when they were apart, each group unaware of the other's existence, they were united in their efforts to reconnect, to keep broadening their understanding of the universe, and to continue searching for the eye. The song is, in a sense, not just the theme of the Nomai people, but a theme of continuity. The Nomai, of course, is not the only song that plays during your explorations of these ruins. New yet recognizably Nomai-sounding pieces accompany many major moments of discovery. Upon entering the Southern Observatory in Brittle Hollow, this song plays. It suggests seriousness, intensity, and frustration, and in doing so not only tells us how the researchers themselves must have felt in this space, but also matches and contributes to the feelings experienced by you, the player, as your examination of the observatory reveals how, despite the many technological wonders on display, the search for the eye was not completed here. This song is mirrored by another piece heard on the sun station that's even more emotive. This song feels overwhelming, combining the awe of standing before the sun, the fear felt in exploring this broken, floating marvel, and the absolute dread, as crushing as a star's gravity, that comes with the realization that it doesn't work. The station doesn't work. The Nomai never managed to blow up the sun, they just failed, disappeared. While the search, the song that plays in the Southern Observatory, isn't exactly an uplifting piece, the sense of frustration it conveys carries an implied feeling of hope. The search is unfinished, yes, but it hasn't been abandoned. The sun station dashes that hope, and we feel this in the absence of percussion and other musical elements that lent the former piece urgency. I think these last three songs showcase a core difference between Outer Wilds and Undertale in the way each game aims to add new layers of emotional depth to its music. Where Undertale relies on a linear sequence of leitmotif cameos to suggest or contextualize new information, prompting the player to analyze melodies in a ways they hadn't previously, Outer Wilds create space for the player to interpret sounds from new angles. A moment ago, I explained how the lack of percussion in the song Sun Station can be heard as a sort of defeat. Without the context of the Southern Observatory, or an understanding of the Nomai's goals for the station, it could also simply contribute to an odd or reserved tone. 
The spooky feeling I got from the Nomai when I first started the game was totally valid, as was the lack of any sense of wistful sadness Andrew Prello talks about. The song, as I heard it then, was what it was, and it was equally something else days later. These pieces are as effective as they are because they're accessible from multiple points of view for multiple points in time. My personal journey of recontextualization and the grief that followed came to a head with the Ash Twin, a song that, maybe not so coincidentally, is the same length as the Nomai and that comes directly after it on the OST tracklist. The song is so quiet, yet so massive. It feels like motion, the clockwork turnings of the planets and the marching progress of time. It takes sounds from the previous pieces we heard while using them in what feels like a much more introspective way. For me, this song helped me realize that time must move forward for the story to be complete, but that the ending to that story is not the happy one I'd hoped it would be. It's not even necessarily a sad one, it's simply one that must happen to be true. The project did not succeed, the universe is dying, all the wonderful and brilliant aliens I had come to love have either died or will die today. This song is the natural explosion of the sun, over and over and over. It is the silence that follows. It is the death of the universe. It is a mourning song for those who tried to save it. There's one more example of evolving context I'd like to cover, and that's End Times, the song that signals the end of each in-game cycle. While writing this video, it was really difficult for me to pin down an appropriate place to include this piece. It doesn't fit neatly into a Harthian or Nomai category the way previous songs have, as it isn't really tied to either civilization. Even songs I haven't talked about like Space and many of the planet's themes bear clear associations in terms of the instruments, textures, or feelings they contain, and the functions they perform allowing me to group them in my head into a kind of exploratory category. End Times doesn't play in a particular place the way most songs do, and while others in the game might play at specific times, like how Timber Hearth only plays during the day, this is perhaps the only song in the game that feels universal in its timeliness. Inevitable. So here I am, having realized that the best way to talk about this song is in opposition to those we just covered, as a capstone to the idea of changing impressions. Above anything else, End Times always marks an ending. On a technical level, it tells us that our 22 minutes are over, yet it also signals impending, if temporary, death, both for the player and for the solar system. Initially, this death might spark fear or frustration, surprising you time and again with a not-so-helpful heads-up that the sun's about to explode. As time goes on, you might develop an immunity to the sound. Maybe you've internally memorized the rhythm of the cycle, and are no longer startled when it comes to an end, or you've started to come to terms with the impermanence or ultra-permanence of your place in the solar system. Further down the line, having familiarized yourself with each individual planet's time cycles, you might get into the habit of planning for your next adventure ahead of time, and thus find in the song a sense of optimism as you look forward to waking up on Timber Hearth once again. Where the Nomai songs are shaped most heavily by the lore and bits of world building you discover, and Harthian songs by the people and places you're surrounded by, that is, essentially, both shaped by elements of the game. End Times, more than any other song, is an element of the game shaped by you. That unique series of accidents and discoveries I talked about at the beginning of the video, the story contained in every individual run, is what defines our understanding of this song. In a way, it's like a neat, ominous little bow wrapping up segments of your playthrough, packaging the memories from each run, especially those of how they ended, into portions you can appreciate. This song came to remind me of the time I made it to the White Hole Station using my last bit of oxygen as reserve fuel after accidentally falling into Brittle Hollow's black hole for the first time. It wasn't just my lack of air propelling me forward. The sense that time was running out was, for some reason, just as motivating a factor. And with the music backing my desperate flight toward the airlock, I legit felt like I was living a scene from Interstellar. This development, like many other things in Outer Wilds, probably won't be linear for most players. The feelings suggested by the song are likely to oscillate, particularly as your discoveries lead you back and forth between moments of triumph and failure. For me, the emotional weight that was lost through constant exposure to death eventually came back with a vengeance, as I realized that the ending I thought was temporary was more final than I had imagined. I remember the feeling I had listening to this song one night as I was nearing the game's conclusion, and it was, honestly, despair. I'd just entered Ash Twin for the first time and found out, conclusively, that the project had failed. 
and this knowledge was devastating. The song marked not just the end of my time with the game for that night, but maybe, I thought, the end of my time with the game. Is this all there is, I thought? See all there is to see and eventually just turn it off? I couldn't bear the idea of parting with the game this way, and after turning off my PlayStation, I went downstairs, turned on the shower in an unlit bathroom, and sat under the water crying for half an hour. Where this song experienced a truly incredible evolution, however, was in the part of my playthrough that came next. Having accepted the previous night's revelation as best as I could, I re-entered Ashtwin. Seeing the spinning room full of stars representing the complete history of the efforts and achievements of countless generations past brought up something in me that I did not expect to feel while sitting in my living room. Here were the final marks of an alien civilization that had passed eons ago, who I had come to regard in some part of my mind as family, yet who I had never had the chance to meet, who had ultimately failed in their task of saving their people. Here was the mechanism that I believed was meant to save mine, to save the universe, and right then it dawned on me that I was here to end it, to let it die to let the Nomai and their legacy finally rest. There's no logic to taking the warp core out when your goal is to win the game. There's no one telling you it's something you must do, or even that it's what the game wants you to do. At that moment, I did it because I wanted to see things through, and because it's what the Nomai would have wanted, even though it meant ending a playthrough I desperately wanted to continue. I wanted to know the Outer Wilds had not ended with a game over, but with a goodbye. As I removed the warp core powering the Ash Twin project, a new song began playing. It was like listening to the song that plays when crossing the border in Red Dead Redemption, or hearing Snake Eater as you climb the ladder in Metal Gear Solid 3. Okay, I haven't actually played either of those games, but an example that maybe hits a little closer to home for me in this case is when Vigil plays as you drive through the labyrinth left behind by the Protheans on Ilos and Mass Effect. The labyrinth is dead, stupefying in age, scale, and complexity, and hauntingly beautiful. This song, as perfectly simple as it is, captures a feeling of awe that is almost too big to describe. These moments of gravity, of somber reflection or determination or aloneness, these are the kinds of musical moments that linger in your mind for the rest of your life. Usually you're hearing these songs for the first time. The sense of the sublime is created in part by the shock of the moment, the unexpected. Except here you know this song. The change is different and unexpected and epic absolutely, but it hits as hard as it does because we've heard the original over and over and over, always in a particular context, always at a particular time. The tone here is resolute. It feels for the first time like something you can fight against in some way. Like it's on your side even, even though you know better than ever this isn't a game you win. I'll admit, I didn't make it through this final voyage on my first try. It kind of hampers the suspense when you've already experienced the whole sequence, but having the song back me up as I went through Dark Bramble again, racing against the clock, helped me feel like the moment meant something. As much of I z As much of I been What the f is wrong with me? As much as I've insisted that the game and its soundtrack don't function linearly, I think it's important that we stop for a second and acknowledge how I've framed much of my experience sequentially in a way that makes sense to me. For a while, even as I was finishing the game, I felt like I had discovered everything at the wrong time. I landed manually on the sun station long before I was ready to discover the truths it revealed. The last major location I discovered wasn't Ashtwin, it was the Interloper, and finding the pieces of the puzzle this way initially prompted the anxious voice in my head to scream at me that I had ruined the experience somehow, that I was meant to get to Ashtwin last, that I wasn't feeling as I was supposed to. I get this voice a lot when I play games. It's a voice that insists that I've missed out, that I didn't enjoy something the way it was meant to be enjoyed, and that I'll never get the opportunity to get it right again. And with open world games in particular, it's one I can almost never quiet, because often I feel like I really have missed out. So many games in this genre have a secret, correct way of doing things to the point that I almost never feel comfortable deviating from walkthroughs or player-compiled mission guides on Reddit. Outer Wilds is one of the only two open-world games I've played that managed to convince me that this order or way of doing things really doesn't exist. Though I started the game feeling like I was doing everything ass-backwards, this emotion eventually dissipated, despite my habit of dying in the stupidest ways possible. The discoveries I made through blind luck felt, and were, legitimate. 
and those I made by following what often felt like ridiculous schemes, like hopping inside a jellyfish, rewarded my willingness to experiment and make mistakes, rather than punishing my curiosity or subverting my agency as a player by forcing me back onto a set path. You know how happy I am to finally speak with you. I've been trying for days. It's a matter of utmost urgency, I assure you. Maybe I don't want to talk to you. No. Oh. <clears throat> you do. The same goes for the game's major story beats and the songs that accompany them. While the order in which I encountered important pieces of lore might not have been the optimal pattern my anxiety conjured up, it was entirely organic, unique to me and my way of playing the game. As the narrative sorted all of its smaller components out in my mind days and weeks after I'd finished the game, I realized that all the emotional impact was there, waiting for me. Finding all the pieces of the puzzle my way and feeling them click into place made my connection to the story and its characters all the more sincere. The ending of the game goes a long way toward affirming this. Again, if you've made it this far and still haven't played Outer Wilds, I recommend holding off on this part so you can experience it for yourself. As you explore the forest waiting for you inside the Eye of the Universe, you're tasked with collecting instruments, the Traveler's Instruments we talked about earlier. Each of these collection activities involves a clever puzzle minigame that functions as a callback to previous discoveries and the lessons that can be taken away from them. And as you collect the instruments, the travelers who played them will appear around your campfire. My favorite of these activities comes, assuming you've completed the Quantum Moon portion of the game, when you follow a new but familiar instrument. A paddish, piano, or music box-like sound reminiscent of those heard in some of the Nomai songs. You'll stumble upon a group of Nomai skeletons gathered around a stump, all pointing at what appears to be a star above them. To get to it, you'll need a ship. It's a simple but potent metaphor. By standing on the shoulders of those who came before them, generations past who are now just, well, skeletons, each Nomai reaches higher and higher towards their goal. Eventually, they leave behind a vessel, a piece of technology that allows you, the last living link in this chain, to reach it for them. Taking the mask adds an unexpected member to your circle. Solanum, the Nomai encounter on the quantum moon and whose writings demonstrate unique perspective on the eye, joins the others in their song, telling us that she's a friend, too, that she and the Nomai are just as much participants in our story. Rather than this making me feel like the center of the game's universe, the bridge connecting two civilizations, or the intrepid explorer responsible for finally uncovering the grand mystery, this last intimate moment with the game made me feel like all of us were linchpins, circling one another, essential components in the totality of the gift that is existence. I knew that the story needed all of its pieces to work, that we all connected each other to something that truly felt like it was greater than the sum of its parts. Just like the Nomai couldn't have achieved the incredible feats they did without building on the work of past generations, I wouldn't have been here if it weren't for the many engineers and adventurers who came before me, or for the travelers who had supported me throughout my many loops through the game. This final version of the Traveler's theme said to me that every moment of the journey matters, and so I spent the last few minutes of my playthrough sitting in the circle thinking about all the people responsible for creating them. I believe this song hits home for the same reason Undertale's final song does. It sparks a profound moment of empathy. More than ever, interconnectivity and evolving context come into play, with the different instruments that once signposted divided peoples, planets, and experiences finally combining in an authentic way. You're not lining the Travelers up with your signal scope. You're hearing them play together, everyone around a single fire, for the first time. Where it once felt like I leaned on them to shelter me against the loneliness of space, the solitude of endeavoring solo on a seemingly impossible mission to save the world, I now felt like an equal support, and was prompted to consider their struggles, their hopes, and, most of all, their own feelings of gratitude. Solanum's part was especially moving here. This last element in the theme made it sound a lot graver. Sadder, too, but not bleak. The chords her instrument's tones help build are reflective and hopeful. The end of Undertale, if you played it the way I did, has a lot in common with this scene. Completing Undertale's pacifist rote comes with the joy of setting the monsters you forge friendships with free, but securing that freedom also means letting them go, giving up another chance to engage with them and to make new choices. It's worth it though, you feel that in the hope that suffuses every song, representing the optimism of a community looking forward to a future of connection, openness, and peace, no longer dwelling in anger and pain and secrets. You feel it in the bittersweet nostalgia each melody carries, knowing that it wouldn't hurt if it didn't mean something. To let go isn't to invalidate your time with the game. It's to see people come together as they ought to, at their best, and letting them stay in the story they deserve, even if you're no longer in it. Letting the timeline sit in stone rather than keeping the world and its inhabitants in a perpetual loop, letting the story have an ending, is the greatest act of care and respect available to you. Outer Wild is not exactly the same, of course. Letting go here means accepting death, including the death of those you loved. 
but it also means getting the best glimpse anyone will ever have at the greater picture. A once in a universal lifetime chance to be a witness at the end of time and to honor the memories, intentions, and legacies of two great civilizations. These aren't just two games about time loops, they're games that ask us persistently and quietly to let their universes own their stories, and in so doing teach us how to take ownership of our own. Infinitely widening our perspective with every new encounter and run through the game, finding different paths and information that impart an understanding of the world and its history, questioning our role in the game's story. These are all crucial ways we come to realize the true impact of the choices we make, endowing us with an earnest sense of humility. Forging relationships, appreciating the depth of other people's character and the bonds that connect us, makes us cognizant of our ability to affect those around us and the deep implications of every small decision. It's trite to say, there are no save points IRL, but out here we live with our choices, choices that have far more weight than we realize, and sometimes it's a shocking revelation just to be reminded how extraordinary that is. That's something that used to be really scary to me, but I don't consider it a burden anymore. I'm not alone in writing my story, and Outer Wilds helped me discover just how much listening can help me figure out the part that comes next. I know I'm rambling at this point. I honestly don't know how to communicate the ultimate set of feelings and messages Outer Wilds conveys. I just know that in that moment, it made sense. All of it. The feeling of finishing Outer Wilds, no matter how you play it, is that of disparate strings finally coming together. Like I said at the beginning of this video, Undertale helped me during a time in my life when I was beginning something new and open-ended and frightening. I'm entering a new chapter in my life again now, except this time I'm an adult, and I'd like to think that Outer Wilds has accomplished something similar. That I'm less afraid of failure, of exploration, of death than I once was because of it. Really though, what these games have done for me more than anything else is provide a friend. I can't really play either of them again. They're both a case of, once you get the good ending, move on with your life. Except I can't really do that, either. They're too comfortable. Like riding a bike, I can't just forget how to fly the ship. The magic now is in helping my friends experience these games and what they have to offer. Seeing them discover the games for themselves feels like passing the torch in a way. Watching my friend Armand play Outer Wilds gave me the opportunity to experience everything through a new lens. One that was completely different, but no better or more valid than the one I developed. I saw characters as story arcs develop in ways I hadn't before. I felt a fresh kind of excitement in seeing him visit new locations for the first time, and in watching him piece together each new part of the mystery in ways I hadn't imagined anyone could. His inferences were sometimes nothing like what I'd come up with, and though they eventually led him to the same conclusions, seeing him go in unexpected directions with them and coming away having learned more for it was a blast. I remember him once thinking that he had to follow the deep space probe to beat the game, and while I laughed at the idea, one day I was going back through the game, collecting footage for this video actually, when I found the probe. I didn't know you could. I think it's funny how, even now, my relationship to Outer Wilds isn't static. Knowing that I won't be able to return to either game myself is still hard to swallow sometimes, but one thing I can come back to both of them for time and again is their soundtracks, and that's what I'm going to do now. <laughs> 